Could plant-based vaccines save the world? Scientists say rice, corn, potatoes or lettuce can be used to produce antibodies. It's a kind of complex process which uh, starts by uh, the procedure that infects them with uh, foreign uh, DNA, uh, genetic material that reprograms them to stop doing everything else and just make one protein, recombinant protein, which is a medicine that we want to produce. Biotech firms are already in clinical trials with their plant-based drugs or awaiting approval from health agencies to combat Ebola, the norovirus, and COVID-19. I'm Ben Fazulin. This isn't just about pleasing vegans. A plant-based COVID jab would be cheaper and quicker. And instead of using hamster ovaries or monkey kidneys, you can use veggies or even tobacco. The plants being grown inside this greenhouse could form the basis of a new COVID-19 vaccine. The Nicotiana benthamiana, to give it its proper name, is currently the focus of a study by Canadian biotechnology company Medicargo and Britain's GlaxoSmithKline. 20,000 people are taking part in the trial. It's the first time a plant-based vaccine is being developed. You introduce the DNA, which triggers the production of a spike protein very similar to the coronavirus, but which isn't infectious. When you remove it from the plant, put it in the vaccine and add an adjuvant, a substance that boosts the body's immune response, the vaccine can generate more antibodies. Preliminary results suggest the plant-based vaccine may produce up to 50 times more antibodies than other jabs. Gisela Leclerc is among 7,000 Argentinian participants in the trial. She works as a journalist and has written extensively about COVID-19 vaccines. Now she wants to learn more about production methods herself. A lot of people are looking for natural alternatives, for another way of producing and consuming food. In this context, vegetarians and vegans are especially interested in the idea of a plant-based vaccine. While no other COVID-19 jab is of animal origin either, this particular trial has attracted many vegan and vegetarian test subjects in Argentina. The country, with its rich livestock tradition, is the second largest beef consumer per capita worldwide. But the number of vegetarians and vegans is growing. They now make up over 10% of the population. Linking meat consumption to environmental issues, anything that bans animals from our plates, is very controversial in Argentina. Due to our traditions and deeply ingrained habits. But every day, people are becoming more environmentally aware. Against this backdrop, a plant-based vaccine, even one which is being tested on animals, has already piqued the interest of many people. I asked Zachary Leblanc from Queensland University of Technology why animals are still used to make vaccines. Hey, Ben. Well, that's uh, it's an interesting question. Um, mainly, it, when you say animals, uh, typically what's used for vaccine manufacturers are actually animal cells. So at that point, I wouldn't quite call it an animal because it's not an organism at that point. It's just a cell in culture that's being used to produce these vaccines, which are complex uh, proteins. So I wouldn't quite say that animals are being harmed in the process. Um, but the advantage of using plants is that it's really in the scalability of the system versus these other um, mammalian cell based systems. And why is it cheaper? So it's cheaper because of the scalability, essentially. Um, if you think about the inputs that you need for growing a plant, right, you need to put it, you need to give it water, you need to give it sunlight, and you need to give it dirt. Um, you compare those inputs to a lot of these other systems, which are uh, fermenters that are used to culture large amounts of mammalian cells, and it becomes, it's visibly a lot cheaper. Uh, when you're producing a plant to amplify this biomass, which can then produce your vaccine. 
I was also reading that there's no need for bioreactors, in some cases no purification process. So I guess you're cutting a lot of costs there. And does that make it then safer all in all? So um, in, in terms of safety, yeah, because if, if you think about uh, pathogens that act on mammalian cells, if you're producing um, your vaccine in a mammalian cell, it's, there is a possibility of a pathogen getting that can affect that mammalian cell also affecting the end user. Now, if you're using a plant, um, they don't share a lot of, they don't share any pathogens with humans. So you're not gonna have a pathogen that's gonna attack your, your cultures that would then attack the end user. So in that sense, it's more safe. And to, to answer the bit about bioreactors, actually, um, when you're using plants as a production system, the plant itself is the bioreactor. So that, that sort of feeds into why they're more cost effective as a production platform. So the million dollar question for you, Zach, how much quicker would we have immunized the world if we'd had a plant-based COVID vaccine considering they're quicker, cheaper and safer? Yeah, um, I'd say it's a, yeah, nearly a billion dollar crash question when you're talking about <laughs> COVID vaccines, but, um, uh, I don't think much would change, to be honest, um, because the the hurdle is really getting through those clinical trials. Um, and for production of a COVID vaccine, I mean, there's a group in North America called Medicago that's in phase three clinical trials for production of a COVID-19 vaccine. And um, after receiving the sequence for the spike protein, um, they were able to produce a vaccine within 20 days. So they had it on hand. It's just that you need all that time to make sure it's safe to uh, distribute to the general population. And that's why those lengthy clinical trials are there. So will we get one uh, during this pandemic or, or, or are we going to have to wait some years until we see a plant-based vaccine for, for whatever the disease may be? Oh yeah, well, I mean, let's see how long the pandemic lasts, right? Um, but uh, I, I would say there's, there's some promising candidates that are being produced by Medicago in North America. Um, they have a COVID-19 vaccine, which is in phase three clinical trials, which means, I mean, it, it's, I would expect uh, an announcement about that sometime this year, I think, but um, who knows how, how long these things take. Um, they also have another uh, vaccine, a quadrivalent flu vaccine that they have in production, which is also in phase three clinical trials. So I think it's a really exciting time. And I, I think it's it's likely that we'll be seeing a plant-based vaccine in the near future. Yeah. Just briefly as well, can, can you eliminate the need for uh, animal testing for these vaccines uh, so that the process is 100% vegan? Uh, so I don't know about that part um, because uh, when you're going to clinical trials, you're putting this vaccine into human participants in the trial. And before that step, you want to really test it on a living system so you can be sure that it's safe before it's going in, in a real life person's arm. So um, I, I don't see a pathway towards uh, eliminating the use of animals. Um, maybe sometime in the future when you can um, properly mimic those systems, but at this point, no, I don't think we can eliminate animals from the process. Zachary LeBlanc from QUT, Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane, Australia. Thank you very much for being on the show. Oh, well, thanks for having me. Take care, Ben. Now, here's an interesting question on the Delta variant, but I'll let Derek Williams answer that for you. What makes people with the Delta variant so much more contagious? In trying to answer this, I think that we first need to go back to a term that once got a lot of airtime, but that many of you have probably since forgotten. And, and that's the basic reproduction number of a pathogen, or it's R0. Now, the R0 describes the average number of people that an infected person will infect in turn in an unexposed, unvaccinated population. Uh, when it first hit, the ancestral coronavirus had an R0 of around two to three. So each infected person on average infected two to three others. 
But the original virus has since mutated into a range of variants, among them the Delta variant, and, and it's a lot more transmissible, with an R0 that's estimated to be twice as high, or, or maybe even higher. Of course, a lot more people are now largely immune to the virus due to vaccination or, or previous infection. So each new Delta patient isn't actually infecting twice as many others, but still people who get the Delta variant are a lot more contagious than those who have other variants of the virus. So what exactly has raised the R0 in the Delta variant? Well, researchers think that two changes in particular are probably behind its increased transmissibility. The first involves a set of mutations that they say have altered the structure of the spikes that dot the outer surface of the virus. Uh, the spikes are what allow the virus to latch on to receptors on a cell's outer membrane and break into it. And, and scientists believe that changes to the Delta variant spikes have made that break-in process easier. The second change involves how much of the virus is being produced by cells. Uh, one study found that Delta variant patients had viral loads that were around a thousand times higher than what's found in those infected with the original virus, with that massive replication also possibly happening a lot faster. All of those factors, scientists think, are contributors to making the Delta variant one of the most infectious respiratory diseases out there. See you next time.